Now, 95.9 FM WATD presents Friends with Benefits. Exploring relationships, social issues, and life stories. Be a part of the show at 781-837-4900. Friends with Benefits with your host, Brian Stratton. Trying to hold your feelings back, trying to win some kind of game. Spinning all those nights with all those lies. Uh. If you're trying to erase your past, but add it to the pain, you're bound to lose a light that's in your eyes. Even a fool, even a fool who's blind can see a trap.
95.9 WATD Friends with Benefits here on a Wednesday night, March 2nd. And uh, beautiful New England weather. We're having a great run around here. Anytime you hit 50-plus in this region in the beginning of May, you're uh, you're a winner. And uh, thank Ryan Stanton for being here in the studio tonight. We have a special guest. Uh, is he on the line? Bill Champlin. Bill, you there? Yeah, here. There you are. Hey, great. Sorry, I wasn't home. I got a I got a late call for a for a session, and I came over. I actually played hi hat on something. How's that? Wow. I'm, so I've never heard anybody get hired just to play hi hat. Well, this is something we were working on, and in, in the, there was something wrong with the original track that somebody played. You know, it was, I think it was Burley Drummond was playing the original track. And oh, uh, Burley uh, from Ambrosia, yeah, or Burley, yeah, 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 great, great drummer. Tell really. him I said hello. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, we just needed to, you know, put some kind of hi hat on there because nobody bothered to record the first one. <laughs> <laughs> There's some leakage into the into the tops, but you know, that's all just you know studio crap that we do. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. And we just want to welcome Bill Champlin on the line. Seven eight one eight three seven forty nine hundred. That's seven eight one eight three seven forty nine hundred. Or on the email line at cta management at rocketmail dot com, and that's where you can send an email if you have any questions for Bill. Bill. We just led off with a track, uh, Love is Gonna Find You, and that was one you sent to me about 20 years ago. You sent me three albums back, I'd say it's about 20 years ago now, Burn Down the Night, Through It All, and No Wasted Moments. It said, Brian, catch this stuff. You know, uh, it's it's big. I think, I think this song was on... Uh, uh he started to sing. He album, started to sure. sing was this yeah. one, right, exactly. Yeah. I'm getting my albums mixed up, but I have uh, them all. Hey, listen, you know, you, you probably spent the same top dollar for your memory loss as I did for mine. <laughs> <laughs> so about well, 20 years ago, you sent me these tracks and said, give them a listen and uh, you'll like it. It's big over Japan. And I found out, man, they were they were selling like hotcakes overseas. And, um, well, I don't know about hotcakes, but they were doing, they, you, know, you know, these things, that people have them. They have copies of them. I, I, every time I go over, I sign a few. Right now, we're kind of, kind of on the case for this CWF album that we did. We're just really excited about talking which is about Champlin, that. Which Champlin, Williams, and Freestead, which is a, a, a guy in Sweden who you know, produces all these records. And him and me and Joe Williams from Toto, Toto's a new lead singer. So we're, uh, you know, we're, we got an album out with the three of us. Pretty cool. Pretty cool record. We're going to cut off a cut uh, called Carry On in a few minutes uh, when, we, when we lead into that. But uh, what was the genesis of this album, Bill? I know you've been working with Joseph Williams for, man, a couple of decades. And yeah, also, I mean, Joe and I yeah. just, you know, sometimes we we start off just doing background vocals for different, you know, mostly Japanese records and stuff like that. And we just start kind of went, hey, man, your arrangement and my arrangement together, we come up with some pretty cool stuff. So we ended up doing a handful of things. You know, there's a, did you ever hear the the acapella record we did? Well, I did, yeah. You you sent that to me, too, uh, way yeah. back. And uh, yeah, well, I think did, Bobby Kimball was on there. kind of like that. Yeah. It was actually a tune that me and Will Champlin wrote together uh, right after 9-11 that we did on that, on that CWF album. It's a pretty cool little piece of music. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell you one thing. We need to give uh, Will Champlin props, too. He was uh, on The Voice uh, 2013, and he's been uh, writing up a storm. And that's your son, of yeah. course. I know Will's actually getting up there. He must be in his, his high 20s now, right? Oh, he's, he's even older than that, but let's not even talk about it. Wow. <laughs> but, but I'll Rub tell you. Rub it in, man. Rub it in. <laughs> he's, he's set his heels in this business and really taken off, and uh, yeah. well, we congratulate him. And of course, well, I think he's got a, he's got a, a, a co-write on the new, one, the new One Direction album, which is kind of cool. And those guys actually sell copies of records and stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a rare thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's nice to get royalties once in a while, Well, you know, it? I wanted to get their album, so I went and shoplifted it. So that's cool. <laughs> I mean, basically, you can take the kid out of Marin County, but you can't take Marin County. You can't take the thief out of the kid. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, we got to talk also. Your, your wife, Tamara, was on that last track. Um, yeah. When you sent me that, man, that knocked me out about 20 years ago. And she's, she's uh, as Doc said, man, that bird can chirp. <laughs> <laughs> but, Tamara, yeah, Tamara's a really great singer, great songwriter. What I love about tracks like that on those albums that you did back in the 90s is, you know, there was no auto-tune, no, no screwing around. It was basically get, get over here and play or get out of here. And, uh, if I remember correctly, I think we did this on, uh, I think that, I'm pretty sure that was on 24, one of the last records I did on 24 track. Four I think star. it was a two-inch two, two inch tape, 24 track. Yeah, good, yeah, 24. I had a, a Sony MCI 24 track. It was just a workhorse. I mean, I had to use it. 
machine for 20 years before I sold it. When I sold it, I got, I bought it for eighteen thousand dollars, and I sold it for six hundred to somebody for spare parts for their machine. <laughs> it's exactly. It just it's basically in somebody's museum right but now. But believe me, I got my money's worth out of it over a period of 20 years. The thing, you know, the thing was a, you know, it was all road hard and put up wet kind of thing. Well, you know? it was one of those things too that back in those days, I mean, those machines you had the tech and you had the, you know, just the splicing of the tape makes me sick just thinking about how you had to do that. But yeah, you know. Oh man, I, I walked into just I think last year I walked into I had a vocal session at Village and I, I wasn't Village it was uh, Westlake and I walk in and this is the room that they cut Thriller in and this little they had a little soffit in the room where the where the studio used to sit you know and oh, yeah, there right. was a there was a chair sitting there now it was all everything was all <laughs> total you know directed disc and you know it was uh, you know they had a they had a disc drive over there but they, you know a big major drive like a cray supercomputer looking thing <laughs> but uh but i said there was no there was none of that oxide smell in the room you know i love the smell of oxide <laughs> in the morning it reminds me of victory <laughs> <laughs> well i mean like i said it's a it's a new day now and now this album uh with uh joseph williams and peter now let me get his name right is it freestat 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 Freestet, S T E D T. He's a West Coast uh, phenomenal guitar player. Kind of really a, good guitarist, and, and, and he's a, he's a, I think he's a really good producer. I mean, his, his songwriting is always kind of leaning toward the West Coast, which is one of the reasons why when we did the album, I kind of got in there with Joe, and we went, we picked some other tunes, other than the the the, the West Coast kind of stuff, which is all really good, and he does it as good as anybody out there. He really does. It, but it, sometimes it, you want to hear something a little bit different. There's uh, on the Japanese version. And there's a tune that I wrote with uh, uh, with a, a friend of mine, a real good friend of mine, and Paul Paris and Brenda Russell. Okay. And Brenda's just a great, great songwriter. Oh, she had, and she had some great hits back in the day, of course. Yeah. Oh, uh, she's she's you know she's still around. She just I think she just did the movie for uh, uh, Color Purple, but then she wrote all the stuff for the uh, for the Broadway show. So I mean, she's she's a major writer. She always has been. Sure. And, sure. and a good friend. I've known her for years, and we finally got together and wrote one, and we ended up putting that song on the. Uh, it was on as a bonus track on the Japanese version of CWF. Yeah, I mean, so what 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 made this album really come about? Well, you know, Peter, you know, I started just appearing on a couple of his, like, just sort of West Coast records. And then, you know, and then I introduced him to Joe, and, you know, we got Joe on a couple things around that period of time doing some backgrounds. And then he said, hey, can I get, you think I can get Joe to sing a lead? I said, well, here's his number. He called him and asked him. So we did some stuff, you know, kind of did it around my house and my studio in Woodland Hills. Then I kind of lost touch with him a little bit, you know, and then the next album he did, I think there was an album that him and Joe just did together. I don't even think I'm on anything. I might be on maybe one song. And then he said, uh, "He said, hey man, I'm coming over. You feel like working?" And uh, and I said, "Yeah, of course, man. I, you know, anytime you want to come." He says, "But let's let's time. Let's why don't we just do it? Because we did a tour with the three of us. It was uh, it was me and Joe and Peter. And actually, Tamara went, and I got uh, uh, he had a piano player, Stefan. Uh, I forget Stefan's last name, playing piano, and a uh, bass player from Norway. And, uh, and and I brought Herman Matthews with us, and Herman played drums on the on the tour. And that was uh, you know that kind of became a real favorite." You know, kind of a local favorite in Scandinavia. The, the, the DVD sold pretty well. So, the, the, you know, Peter all of a sudden went, you know, I'm thinking that if we just do a three guy album, we might have a better shot. So he said, I'm, I'm coming over. You got a studio? I said, oh, I got my garage and decent microphones and a, and a Pro Tools rack, a Pro Tools rig. We can go ahead on. We got so we got my friend Kenji Nakai, the engineer who who mixed one of the Sun's albums, mixed Hip Little Dreams. He's a great, great engineer. We got him to engineer it, and we just went in and knocked off the vocals on all the stuff that was there. And then at some point, I said, you know, this is fine, but I think a whole album of this kind of this kind of really sort of slick. But, you know, slick stuff, which is really cool. I mean, believe me, it's good. There's a few great moments on that record. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, yeah. The whole album of it would be like having just nothing but frosting on the cake, you know? Let's, sure. Let's throw some cake in there. So we did, uh, you know, I had a, I had this tune that Will had recorded just with a couple of acoustic guitars and a few background vocals that's called uh, Rivers of Fear that we wrote right after 9-11. And so I said, you know, hey, Joe, what do you say you what do you say we rearrange this and you and I do exactly what we did on the West Coast All-Stars record? And go in and stack the, stack the background, you know, stack all the whole thing, do it all in vocal. And Joe does a kind of great bass drum with his mouth. I mean, there's, the only thing on there that's not that's not vocal is a couple of finger snaps. Huh. That's it. You wow. know what I mean? Well, in his in his great tracks called "Runaway" and "Evermore" and and Al yeah, "Evermore" is a tune I wrote. I actually wrote with uh, it was you know we wrote it basically for Al Jarreau or you know Al wanted it, but Al hasn't he somehow 
problems have ever arisen, and he's had you know so he's had some sickness in his family and different things like that. So he kind of got you know went slow down, and he may still cut it at some point in the game. But it was sitting there for so long. I said, hey guys, you know let me let me just talk to Al and those guys and see if they mind if we put out our version of it at this moment. And it was it was it was weird because I was actually was in Sweden for something else, and and Peter said let's go to lunch with Randy Goodrum, who's a great songwriter. What a songwriter! Sir. Oh, it's one of the best. And I saw him in the video. So I'm in Stockholm. Home. And this one I was still living in Nashville, right toward the end of it. I'm in Stockholm having lunch with Randy, and we make a date to write together. It turns out he lives four miles from my house in Nashville, mm. <laughs> or actually in Franklin. And so I just drove four miles, and we wrote, and I brought him this chorus. He said, "Man, it's like driving a Cadillac into my car, you know, sitting into my into my driveway. This is beautiful. Let me just work on the lyrics." And he came up with Evermore, and it's a gorgeous song. It really is, yeah. Full tilt, gorgeous song. Chorus on the thing is just is just like butter, man. <laughs> and I, and we always thought that man, this would be a great kind of follow up for after all for Al, you know, which he thought too, you know. But there's uh, we just said, well, hell with it, let's just do it ourselves. I and mean, then if Al you know, wants to do it, it's not like we're going to get in his way. That's right? right. He can always pick up the baton from there. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, looking at this, I mean, and I know that you guys are talking about maybe a European thing this spring? Yeah, I think we're going to go over, I'm going to go over in late May, we're going to do about maybe six or seven gigs, and I think we're looking at something in, I think it's early June in, uh, uh, in what do you call it, in, uh, in Japan. We're looking at, at a couple of, maybe three nights at uh, Blue Note in uh, Tokyo. What is it about overseas that they see such an intrinsic value in your music and also Joseph's Toto's, what is what is that magic? Well, this was like in, in Japan and in, in Sweden, they call it West Coast music. And I think it just like, it comes under the heading of like you know it maybe started like around Sup Degrees, some of the Earth Wind and Fire stuff, and then Foster Foster and me. Uh, you know, there's a handful of other artists. You know, uh, I think Stevie Dan kind of fits into that, you know, somewhat into that thing. It's and it's sort of a little bit educated is what kind of was well. It's very the, it's very cerebral. You know, yeah. the music. Well, I mean, but it still gets up and shouts. It still has you know some hard guitar stuff and guitar solo stuff in it. There's still some stuff like that, but there's just the way it was, uh, just the way it's 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 put together is usually just a teeny little bit educated. You know, I mean, it's still pop songs. It's still not pushing it too far, but it's it's if it's going to go a little ways, then it's going to go a little ways. It's it's kind of a cool cool thing at the time. But now a lot of the West Coast fans go, well, if, you, if, it, if, if it doesn't sound exactly like these first early records that we had, we don't like it. Well, well, you know, suddenly what made it great at the beginning was the fact that it opened things up. But don't open them too far. <laughs> no question. Now, pre, uh, with speaking with Bill Champlin here, and um, principally people know you for your lead vocals with the Supergroup Chicago and even the Sons of Champlin, which, funny story, I mean, you got you and Chicago Chicago debuted what around the same week in sixty. I think so. Yeah, yeah both double late, albums. Very late '68 or very early '69. Both double albums. Both of them actually didn't really go too far at the beginning, yeah. but were discovered later. Both of them. Yeah, well, those guys really had good management, and they were and they were just uh, they're kind of lucky in that they had the, they had like basically they were you know like the house band at the whiskey for a while. Sure, and that had a lot of credence. They had friends. And, and, well, Hendrix came and heard of them. I want, Taps, I want yeah. you guys to come out on tour with me. So they, they had a handful of really good things. I mean, not only Gary that Kapp is Jimmy Hendrix's favorite guitar player. Absolutely, and not only that is Jimmy Garcia is no slouch there. He's, yeah, and Jimmy, I think was just had just come off a pretty big hit with uh, with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. So correct. He was he was kind of you know people were looking at. There's a point where where I think the industry looks at the, the producer before they even look at the artist and go, well, man, this guy got a hit with that guy. And that means that there's there's a good chance that there's going to be a hit here. So, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, you know, I, I don't know all of the artists that Max Martin produces, but I like his record. You know what I mean? It's like one of those kind of things. And, or, you know, Mutt Lang. Wow, I love, I love that guy's records that he makes. So I don't even care who the artist is. I just want to hear the records because they're sonically so they were sonically so great. Weren't they so great? Ahead of their time, of course. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the emails because there's a bunch popping up in front of me here. So let me get down. Uh, yeah. The Stick first the positive ones, man. <laughs> well, I don't see any negatives. As you don't see yet. anything like <laughs> is that Champlin's car that's double parked yeah. out in front of the studio? <laughs> Where, where's my child support? No, no, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. you slept with my wife. <laughs> I think he must. 
be talking about Brian. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. It's, I hope it's not you, man. But anyways, I'm looking here, and uh, uh, Rich from New York wants to know when you tour. Actually, when the the U.S. can see Bill Champlin in concert uh, this summer, this fall, with any configuration. So you tell us. Well, we're looking at maybe – now, you, you're in kind of the Boston area, right? I'm Boston, but this is obviously online right now, so it's going everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, we're kind of looking – I mean, with Danny, I mean, I do a lot of gigs with Danny Seraphin, and, you know, we have – Danny who? Ball. Danny Seraphin. Oh, yes. I think I know him. CTA. Yeah, he's a uh, – you know, he used to have a deli down around the corner. But, <laughs> but well, you know, one of the drummers kind of went uh, went left and uh, – and, uh, <laughs> No, thanks. I'm just what, what, a, what a dynamic, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Bill, because that CTA Full Circle album to me uh, is just, you sing a, a, an amazing testimonial in that song. It's just Well, you yeah, know, wrote a pretty good song. What's that? That's a, that, a Full Circle is a really cool song. You know, the, Who wrote that? weird is that, that they wanted to have that song done for the album before, which they called Full Circle. Okay, they don't right. really have a song done yet, so they put out the full the first you know CTA album, California Transit Authority, and then they and then and then they finally you know finally finished the song and Danny called me and said you want to sing this I said well let me look at the lyrics I looked at the lyrics I said oh man of course this is your story man this is a cool thing yeah he really he really nailed it and then you really uh, delivered it and not yeah. only that is I get really well, I went home I went home horse. So I know something happened that night. Hey, Bill, you can Harrison, still... what happened to you? Just you, you gargle sand or something? You, yeah, you can still hit the high notes, and that's all I care about. Well, yeah, I got to fight for them sometimes. <laughs> you know. Hey, you know, it's just... A, it, it's, a, singing isn't a matter of chops. It's a matter of wanting to. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that still want to, but just can't do it anymore. I mean, there is a certain age where it seems like some of the high range kind of eludes. Well, I don't have to worry. I'm 29. I got a long yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk. I stopped, I stopped having birthdays. I started having anniversaries of my 29th birthday. I figured that's the best way to do it. You know what? Absolutely denial. Yeah. But listen, Bill, uh, on Sacred Ground, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because that song, Sacred Ground, your son Will sang. And well, that originally, I, originally Larry was singing it, and then Will started working with Danny. Yep. And Danny said, "I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Will sing that tune instead of Larry. It might be kind of cool." And I'd already done the I stacked all the backgrounds on that. It was that's my so point. So that song actually was all Will and me. Halfway into that song, when your backgrounds come through with Will's, the the vocal timbre is just it's amazing. And that song, yeah. it really sells a song. And Danny playing like he's a teenager again. Just Danny's playing really good. He's I mean, amazing. you know, there was a time where, where I think we were all a little bit rusty, and Danny was, you know, we are just all paying, paying way more attention to things that, that weren't necessarily musical. And I think at some level, Danny's really been paying attention to music the last, I'd say, 10 years for sure. And uh, his playing has shown it. I mean, he's, he's got, he's got he's a, the strangest drummer to play with in a way because he, he, he just suddenly in the middle of his song again at different times on different nights some kind of like it'll be like something kicks in like his four barrel kicks in by mistake or something and then the thing will just lift up and just smoke you know he just gets off and into it and and I you know it's just kind of random the rest of the time his time is great his his chops are you know god those fucking hands give me a break he's (laughs) he's a monster you know but there's points where all of a sudden this just kind of excitement just starts to generate you know and it's like we all and the the guys in the bench is oh okay here we go we're all we all pick up with it you know and it's not an, it's not a matter of beats per minute it's a matter of just this this just sort of intensity starts to come out it's really cool well it's almost like he reinvented I himself forgot how cool it was you know and whereas normally it doesn't you know everybody stay you know I mean I I, I got really tired of like oh, we all want to keep this down keep it down keep it down everybody keep it down bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. And um, so you're going to be in North America with CTA this summer? Uh, possibly. We're, we're looking at something, I think, in, in, in August. I don't think there's any. There's a, there's a, I think there's a private thing we're doing, a sure. corporate thing that we're doing back there. And, I, and, I, and we're all just starting to maybe look around and see if there's something else we can do while we're there. You so, know, Rich. We already got a ticket back and a you know, ticket out and a ticket back. <laughs> Might as well catch a few if we can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, let, let's talk a, a little bit. I mean, I know we. I don't want to spend too much time on Chicago, but your days, so you spent 28 years with these guys. And, yeah, um, and two of them were fun. <laughs> so 26 of them 
will really, you know. No, it's like uh, uh, my my thoughts were when you first entered the band, I didn't think they really thought of you as being the forefront lead vocalist until Cetera left. And then when he left, man, you were just kind of thrown in the fire and it just worked. It just worked. No, it wasn't really when he left. What happened is I think they, they just sort of handed it over to Jason on the next album. And then I think the next album after that was, uh, that was 18, which Foster did. So I mean, we had to keep the, the, you know, someone decided that the tenor being the front man basically had to had to stay upstairs on it, right? So Absolutely. that's kind of how, the way that one came down. And then the next one, Ron Nevison did, and, and he kind of basically sort of jumped on, you know, he said, well, there's some, and, and we were talking about looking at Diane Warren songs, which are fine, good songs. And uh, and he said uh, he said I want to I want to use that guy because I think he's heard me before or something. And then you owned Chicago nineteen. Basically, that was nineteen. Yeah, amazing w- yeah. what that. But it got back to being just Tanner Tanner City. You know, after a little while, I mean, I figured this was just. I mean, they look at it as this is just a fluke. This is you know this is just about Diane or Ron Nevison or something. It's about everybody but Bill. Bill Bill's got nothing to do with it. Well, it's funny you say that because not if you listen to nineteen and there's ten tracks on that album. I, I'll tell you, there's nine that I thoroughly enjoy, um, and it, I think it was one of their best albums in the later years. Really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Run Around. What I mean, you and Jason going back and forth on vocals with that. Uh, we can last forever was good. Um, obviously, uh, look away. I don't want to live without your love. Yeah. Um, you know all this stuff. It was great. It was a great yeah. album. And uh, you're right. They did get away from that that blueprint. Uh, the next album, it kind of the, there was a sea change. And I don't. I'm not really sure why. Well, it all came back. It sort of all came back to tenor at some point in the game. That's where it ended up. You know, ended up being. I think the guys are just there. They were so. Still, you know, imprinted by the Sotera thing that I think they just sort of went, well, that's, that's, that's been our bread and butter. That's how we got to do this. You know what I mean? Well, it's not bad. That's fine. Well, Bill, I'm going to put you on hold for a second because we want to take a quick clip of Carry On. So if you'll stay on the line with us, we'll be right sure back enough. with Bill Champlin. Fine. is gone But we still can make a change This is where our hearts belong Stand up again and again and again
95.9 WATD. You have Bill Champlin on the line. That was Carry On. Uh, Williams, Champlin, and Freestit, right? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, Champlin, it's CWS, Champlin and Williams in Free State. My name is first. I thought it was, <laughs> but I looked online and it had Williams on first. On his on his website, it says Williams first. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kidding. I don't know. Yeah. I, I really. Cares? It's all, it's, it's actually all Mr. Bill. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got to, I mean, you got to laugh when you hear this. Do you know the, the band Hanson, the three kids that sing there? Yeah, they were great. Yeah, they, they just sent an email, uh, Zach. I think it says Zach Hansen says I want to. Uh, uh, says Will and Bill sound like family when they sing together. How do you well, like that? Well, you know, I mean, I, if you look close and probably realize <laughs> it, you know, David Foster heard Will one time and said he he sounds exactly like Tamara and you. <laughs> I said, kind well, of I yes, how he has. That happens. He, has <laughs> he has your soul and Tamara's range. Yeah, the town, he, Will's got range, man. He goes he goes up. 150 miles if he needs to. It's insane. It's insane. But that's funny that you have a, a fan in the Hanson band. Wow. Who would have ever known that? Hey, I love those guys. Those guys were. Those guys were and are probably just insanely great at this, this stage of the they're game. They're still playing around. Hey guys, if you if you ever uh, want to be on my show, please call sometime, man. I love that band. You know. Yeah. So yeah. thanks for checking in. Todd Todd here is uh, checking in from Philadelphia. Wants to know if uh, Tamara is in your band Sons of Champlin permanently. Oh yeah, does she does oh, yeah. she tour with you guys when you play? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, we, there's not no tour. We just do gigs here and there. Okay. So we don't really play a lot, and usually we play only in the areas that we play that we play in. You know, I mean, which is kind of like Northern California. That's sort of our backyard in a lot of ways. And we don't do a lot of gigs. It's, it's just you know, and we're not doing them to make any money. That's for sure. We're just doing them really for fun. We got merchandising. We got do we do the whole thing to try to at least make it possible to do it so without losing you know without you know digging deep in the pocket. So I'm, um, so we kind of act like it's a like like we're trying to make it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But you know, we're all we're all at the age where we realize ah, the chances of that are probably slim and none. But let's let's at least play for our fans. We we did a gig last week and it was really fun. We had Norman Greenbaum sit in with us. Oh, no was, kidding. Well, he's from that area. He's from Santa Rosa. Right? Okay, a beautiful area. Love that. And then and then the guitar player who played on uh, Hip Little Dreams album, Tal Morris, sat in with us. So it was me and Tal and Carmen on a few songs. And Carmen and Tal have just tore it up. I mean, both of them were just, just such screaming. Great guitar players. It's like wow, this is cool, man. How, how many sons are actually originals? Uh, uh, Jeff Palmer uh, came in in 1967, and Tim Kane is back in the band. He okay. was he and I actually started the band when we were still in high school. I think. Interesting, because I feel like the Sons is kind of like the original jam band. Well, yeah, except we're not really a jam band. Well, you, you know? were you were then, weren't you? Well, I think we 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 opened up more sections for for blowing. At that, That's what I know, meant for, for yep. solos and stuff like that. But it really, is a song band. Sure. It's just that I try to write the songs knowing that I got great players in the band. I try to write the songs so that I can kind of you know push push that part of it. You, you know, know and, and the, the Sun stuff that I knew from way back when I listened, um, and I'm talking years ago. Uh, I remember songs that were six, seven, eight, nine minutes long. You know, and it, lo- yeah. it was a lot of blowing, of course. Well, I mean, Freedom was 14 minutes. It was there one whole side of an album. Freedom was exactly. Get high. I think you know. It's funny. Get high was. Uh, was about five something, maybe six something. It was just enough time for the, for the the FM disc jockeys to start start put that song on on the at the beginning of their show. Go out on the fire escape, smoke a joint, come back in, and they're set for the rest of the, <laughs> for the rest of the day. Beautiful. And, and uh, FCC got wind of that, and that yeah. kind of stopped pretty quick. <laughs> we love that behind the music kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. How yeah. did how did you get involved with Elton John? I did a couple of dates, you know, a couple of a couple of his records. And I think it was. Uh, was that a Caribou? I mean, were you doing that there or? Uh, no, elsewhere? no, no, no. It was, it was much later than that. Okay, I mean, it was okay. Uh, he was. It was just he called me. Uh, it was weird. I had just had an accident at washing dishes and cut my hand really badly. Oh. And uh, and I was looking at the like the web of my left left hand, the web of my thumb, going, well, it doesn't really hurt very much. And I just opened up the thumb, and I was looking at the bone. And I was going, oh my god, this is not going to be good. Right, <laughs> right. I'd cut right through it with a, a glass broke while I was washing it. <laughs> and uh, uh, teach me to do dishes. You know what I mean? But, oh, uh, absolutely. Yep. 
So, but uh, and then the phone rang. It was Elton John. He wanted me to do a date. I said, Elton, can you just give me a number and I'll just call you back because I got this thing going on. I really think I need to get over to emergency. He said, Get your ass over there now, man. <laughs> said, You're a piano player, aren't you? I said, Yeah, and guitar. I said, it Seems like something you should take care of. So give me a call back. <laughs> he said, He's a good guy. But we did uh, me and and uh, and uh, Max Carl and uh, Nigel and D uh, did all the stuff on Little Genie. Oh, what a great man! That was a tremendous track from. Uh, yeah. It's probably oh, 1980, yeah. right? Somewhere. Yeah, around and, there. I, and I can't remember the sax player. Is the, I think it's the same sax player that played on uh, on Billy Joel's. Uh, he, I forgot. 52nd Street. No, it was on the Glass one. You know, the, you know uh, just the way you are. Uh, oh, the, oh, I know who you're talking. He just he just passed away about a year ago. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I've, and I've, he's about seventy three years. Old. I remember who he is. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, he's a classic uh, obsession. Really, guy. really. Oh, it was Jim Horn. Jim, Jim? Horn uh, on on alto on that. So, you know, he he was just a sweet sweet player in any place he touched. You know, anything he put put him, and he got him near a microphone. It was always just great. Hey, I got a, I got a, another email uh, coming in from Dana from Boston. I don't even know whether I should ask you because you probably don't know anything about this, but I'm gonna I'll throw it out there anyway. He wanted to know if you had any idea about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, with the Chicago thing with Peter Cetera and his uh, refusal to play with the band. Um, no, I don't know anything. About yeah, that's what I figured. I I kind of don't pay much attention to it anymore. I mean, it's not it's not my world. What do I, you know? Me knowing about or not knowing about something that Chicago's doing is doesn't make any you know, there's no reason. For well, it. I think he was looking more for the Peter Cetera side, but I'd say well, I go know, to Cetera I, I do know com. Something that you know, Peter's Peter's a good guy. Actually, he wanted to try to get everybody, all the old all the old guys in there, and the band had not you know nobody wanted to do that. And that's he what I that's to what get I heard. Chris Pinnock and me and and. Uh, Donnie and you know just a handful of people. He said, "Man, I thought it would be really great if everybody just came in, you know, did one song or something like that." And I don't think any, I don't think that was flying at some level. But I, you know, he was really trying to be fair and, re- and be really cool about it all. And uh, you know, I talked to him on the phone. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I mean, but this is before all this was coming down. He he still had kind of hopes to try to get a whole thing going on. And I don't think I think all they really wanted to do was just to get Peter and to try to sneak him into doing a tour or something like that. I, I really don't think he wants to. Right, and um, it just seemed like his intentions were a feel good night of uh, seeing the old guy, seeing you. Well, seeing, that's what uh, I think he probably had in mind. But you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you what came down because I'm not privy to that kind of information. Sure, but I know I know people's tendencies, and I know how people get treated in certain situations so it didn't surprise me when i heard that he was just around about oh, this is you know this is more bs and than, you know it feels like the same thing that i left for so why why, why bother doing it and it's best it's probably best to leave alone i, mean, I worked with tommy thayer uh last week at a, at, a, at a benefit and you know he's been in kiss forever and uh, they didn't. When they were inducted, they didn't let him in either. You know, they didn't induct him. It's either, a strange policy, my friend, and I have no idea what, what you know. What well, makes I the think wheels they just want to. You know, mostly I get the feeling when the, when there's an award given to somebody, you know, those kind of things, they're really awarding them for the for the beginnings of their career, not the not last week's gig, but the first mm-hmm. gigs that you played. You right. Know? Not or not absolutely. the last album, but the first album, and I think that's, in that sense, I think the founding members is a is a really good call. I think if that's what they're really being awarded for, their first you know two or three or four albums, man, they deserve it. It was awesome records. Absolutely, and Dana. So I'd go to petersatera dot com because I know he he's thrown out a couple of. Um blurbs or, or whatnot on the front of his site. So check that yeah. out. Maybe you'll get some well, more Peter's, information. Peter's, you know, if if you want to hear really one of the world's premier singers and one oh. of the one of the world's premier voices, go hear Peter. He's just worth listening to, man. He's such a great, he's got such a, a, a singular sound and tone and timbre. It's just, it's just something unbelievably great about his singing. And, you know, with him, he can bring it down a little lower. He didn't have to sing all the way up in that screech range. Yep. And he still sounds like Peter, you know. And he still got that tone and that that sound. And, and it's just, uh, you know, really, really, you know. Well, I like, knew you uh, enjoyed the hell out I, of it. Well, around. I mean, we we got <laughs> whenever we sang together, it was always. I mean, uh, we went out to do a to do a demo before we got in the band that uh, Danny was producing a demo for a friend of mine, Angelo. And uh, and uh, and I had done Angelo's last studio album, like I don't know, a couple of years before. And he called me and said, "Hey, man, you want to come in and, and do this?" And I was like, right in the middle of doing the Rit album, but I was just, you know, we were doing late sessions, 
me and Eric were singing like all night long. It was just insane. We were tired, right? And I said, well, you know, I got kind of a cold. He says, well, you know, Pete said the same thing. I said, Pete? Who's Pete? He said, well, Peter Cetera, but he's going to come in anyway. I said, well, you know, my cold ain't that bad. I'd like to sing it. <laughs> yeah, no so kidding. So I went in there, and, and you know, the, we, we kind of just sort of, you know, squeaking out some parts in the in the booth, and then we said, "Well, let's go out and see if we can throw throw some stuff down." And we started we started singing together on this demo. It was for uh, for this guy Angela, who's a great, another great singer, unbelievable voice. And uh, and we, uh, you know, everybody in this booth just went, "Whoa, what's that? What kind of blend is this about? Man, this is flying like crazy!" And Danny didn't, you know, Danny was producing the session, so he was there. So I think that was. Well, that's that was that, I think the light bulb went over Danny's head. Well, of course. you know, you see, Danny's light, very good at that. The light bulb was an acetylene torch. And uh, went, yeah. Oh my God, this is gonna, this is wow, dig this because we and we and we immediately. It's just started blending together really yeah. great, and I, you know I was I was had a pretty good blend with Peter if we really spent a minute or two on it, really getting the you know the right mics, the right compressors, the right all that stuff. You get all that stuff together, and then we were we always sounded pretty good. Yeah, Danny's a great uh, producer in his own right. But uh, another uh, email from Todd, he once wanted to know um, your uh, relationship with Maurice White of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, you know, I sang with him on a on a Denise Williams album. Uh, uh, on a couple of songs, and, and you know, and I have, I think, just on one song, uh, "When Love Comes Calling." So you guys when knew each other to a. Uh, comes calling, yeah. knocking, knocking, knocking at my door. That gets me and Maurice and, and Denise singing backgrounds. Oh, that. nice! Yes, and that's really kind of the only time I really worked with Maurice. I mean, I knew him. We, you know, because of the, because of the. I mean, I had co-written a song that they had released. And of course, so I kind of <laughs> knew him, but I didn't know him. I knew Verdine a little bit better. I mean, just because I kept running into him for some odd reason. You know, sometimes you just see people because for no particular reason. Yeah, like at the deli or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. You know, yeah. wow, car wash, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> exactly. And uh, you know, Verdine was you know was kind of a friend of mine, so you know, we always kind of had a good time hanging. And uh, and so, but Maurice was always you know he was always kind of busy doing other stuff, so I didn't really know him that well. I sang. I might have sung with him. I, I sang on, a, I think, on a Tube's song. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the tip of My Tongue might have been the name of the song. Okay. On the tip of my tongue. Da, 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 da. It was something that, that, that I sang and then Maurice sang, but I don't think we did it on the same session. It doesn't ring a bell, but maybe, uh, I'll, you know, it'll come the to tube, me. I think it was on the last, you know, David, I think, did three Tubes records, and this and this was one that didn't quite do that well. The first two were, were really slamming, but... Uh, and, and, I think, I, you know, I can't even, you know, after a while, it's just a, it's a gray zone. I just know that well, I mean, there are a handful of sessions and a whole lot of a whole lot of sets of of different headphones around town. You know? There's no question. Hey, I just got some new headphones, and I'm so happy. I can't <laughs> believe it, you know. Well, it's nice to hear yourself once in a while, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it helps sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, you, I think you won a Grammy, didn't you, for that Earth, Wind & Fire song you wrote? Yeah, it was an R and B song of the year. Yeah, I mean, me so. and David and uh, and Jay, and then a couple of years later, Jay and uh, uh, Jay Graydon, and then Jay Graydon and Steve Lukather and I won one for "Turn Your Love Around," the George Benson song. And and to and J- if anybody doesn't know the great Jay Graydon, Steely Dan, and just a million sessions. Jay, Steve- Jay did the solo on "Peg," and everybody's <laughs> mad. Screamingly great guitar. That song. little Hawaiian he, he little did, riff, yeah. There was a there was a song. I mean, you you should check it out. Check out the what they call wire choir. In other words, stacking guitars up. I love it. Yep. On uh, on a, on a song called uh, uh, Twilight Zone on the Manhattan Transfer album. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Check out yep. check out Graydon's wire choir on that. It's like a textbook on how to how to how to make this happen. I mean, he's such a great musician. Well, Bill, we're Jay's up against a, we're up. you know Jay and Randy Goodrum actually have an album and they're working on a second album together. No kidding. Called J and R. J, I like so, it. So the, the letter J, the icon for and, and R is the, the letter R for Randy, and uh, and it's it's only those two guys did these records and they're insane good. Well, Bill, we'd like to thank you for being on the show. You've been a great friend for over 25 years. And uh, people, Google Bill Champlin. He's on Facebook. He's everywhere. The Sons of Champlin. Check out this album. I'm actually out in front of the building stealing your car right now. As we speak. <laughs> so, Bill, thanks for being on the show once again. And uh, continue luck and success. Uh, tell the family we said hello. And uh, we'll, ca- do. we'll catch you down the line, man. All right, well, we might see you if, you know, we're looking at maybe August, trying to get some stuff out there. If you see if we can find some. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope CTA we'll comes out. Yeah, I hope CTA's over here. Yeah. Uh, all right, Bill, take care. Okay, be good. Talk to you soon. All right. And you're listening to 95.9 WATD Friends with Benefits here, and the Peter Black Show will be right after the 10 o'clock break.